Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online Podcast. This is going to be episode 244 of our regular shows and we're recording this on May 28th, 2022. This is the official podcast for the fan site Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com and I'm going to be your main host, Morgan Airspeed Prime. Joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up everyone? Excellent. So, um, on today's show, we're going to be covering some news, including the excerpt preview for the Dawn of Yang Chen. So, as we've been kind of been teasing it, we're expecting it soon. We did get it, so we'll be discussing that and a few other pieces of news. And then for our uh, episode reviews for this week, we'll be doing two Avatar episodes and one Korra episode. So, we're going to be doing 105, uh, The King of Amashu. Uh, we're going to be doing K105 for Korra and the Spirit of Competition and also 106 in Prison. So uh, the Avatar episodes are two of the maybe not super important ones, so I think we can get through them pretty quickly. So we're grouping up three episodes this time out. So we'll start with the news and we'll start with uh, delays once again. Now, I just rec recorded the video earlier on today about this, so I'm kind of almost like tired out talking about delays because it feels like on maybe seven of the last eight podcasts we have discussed delays and all of those delays have included like these same books so it's getting really frustrating at this point and this one just was like the last straw for me in terms of just like oh come on and um, so the details are patterns and time has been delayed again it's been pushed back from the 4th of October to now the 8th of November. So it has received its sort of usual one month delay. The Chibi Comic Volume 1, Angs on Phrasing Day, has had a pretty serious delay here. It went from having been settled with the early August release date for quite a while uh, to now having a 31st of January 2023. So a five nearly six month delay there for the chibi comic out of nowhere um uh, okay. it's really crazy what's happened here um especially that one because it's pushed it out of this year so this now means that there is no new atla content scheduled for the year unless you really want to account the preview for this book from the free comic book thing which is now completely wrong that that's printed in the book that it's out in like july or whatever um but yeah th th this was frustrating on all accounts I, I haven't seen anyone be like super like uh caring particularly about dark horse with this one this is just uh crazy delays at this point i have no idea what's happening here I'm, I'm assuming this is just them finding good release dates for these books stretching things out because they have other reprint books mm -hmm. but i don't really know what are your thoughts on this? A one month delay for patterns and then five months for the Chibi book. This is, I mean, it really gives you no confidence in their release schedule or the release dates because you really have no, no idea when anything is going to come out anymore, which is really unfortunate. I mean, even you no, know, if they're not like the hugest of books and have the load of like new content that we're really looking forward to, it is, you know, something that is new. I mean, we've talked about, you know, a little bit of the Chibi book because we did have the preview from it, but I mean, that's just like so far push compared to what is said in the book, which was already behind what, you know, we already knew was happening. So this is, eh, I don't, this seems like there's a mess going on that we're just not, you know, privy to, of course. Yeah, and, and I think my biggest confusion with all of this is that it's only these two that are getting bad delays. The other books that are on the schedule are, for the most part, keeping their dates. Like, uh, Book 4, Art Book 2nd Edition, has been 12th of July for a while. I think it has only received, like, two, three, four weeks worth of delay since it's been announced. Um, the previous, the Book 3 one, Art Book, again, that came out already. Similarly, that I think only had a one-month delay over the course of its run. And then the North and South Omnibus, which is also an earlier this year release, actually hit its date. So I'm very confused as to why half of the books are, like, hitting their dates or close to it and like it's okay that's fine a, a week or two delay is no real problem and then the other books are just month to month they have no clue really when it's coming out um and especially because there is the split of 
reprint versus new content and it feels very weird that that's the case when it's not even like a significant amount of new content or with the Chibi comic it's clearly been done for a very long time what what are your thoughts on that the fact that it seems like they can keep the dates for like half of the books but then the ones we're actually excited for they just can't (laughs) <laughs> I mean, what is it? Like, I don't know. Maybe it's like delayed hype that they're trying to build on or it's really trying to push with something else. I mean, that is funny that you do bring that up because other things sure do seem to be on schedule. But I mean, that is content that they already have. It's just weird because that's, you know, stuff that we've already read, even if it is in a new format. So I don't know. That's I mean, that makes me think that it's trying to tie in with something. But what that is, we we don't know, of course. Yeah, like uh, like November, what's it really tying in with? Because that's like a month after um, New York Comic Con. Um, yeah. There's no events in like January into February. Well, I suppose early February is sort of the investors thing. But wh- what a weird tie in, like Chibi Comic. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not know really. <laughs> that's not it, unfortunately. Um, next piece of news, though, we'll move on from that. Um Legend of Korra, Korra statue from Dark Horse Direct. So this was a bit of an interesting one in that uh, IGN actually released an exclusive that was an exclusive in that like we didn't hear about this beforehand. They got the exclusive properly this time. Um, it is a Dark Horse Direct, like I said. So this is different than the Zuko and Katara statues that were recently announced. This one costs $200. You can only order it through Dark Horse Direct, which is, you know, the exclusive kind of uh, style thing. There's there's a bit of confusion. I think the article says 1,000, but the details on the product say 2,000 pieces, basically, release in November, December, or January. Um, and the big thing that they're basically saying about this with regards to, I suppose, why it's different than other statues is that it is made of polyresin. Um it is what, 10 inches tall. It has a four inch base. The figure itself is Book 4 Korra, uh, bending all four elements, but uh, in a little more subtle way. It's not super extreme. There's a kind of normal sized fireball, little air swirl on one hand. She's standing on a rock and there's water underneath the rock. Um, I think it looks nice but not two hundred dollars nice that's basically my kind of thoughts on this is that <laughs> if this was just one of those uh was it 60 80 dollar figures uh like the zuko and uh and katara i would kind of be like yeah okay i want a book for Korra, but i don't see necessarily just from the pictures why this is so expensive and i think a lot of other people have been saying much the same in that like you look at the close up in the pictures it doesn't even look like it's like that amazing of a paint job you again you have a little bit of the problem of like a lot of people not quite liking the facial expression and like sort of how the mouth is done and so on um just not quite matching up the price to quality ratio for a lot of people but uh, what are your thoughts on this yeah, I, c- I can understand that sentiment of the, the price, the quality. I mean, overall, it, it looks good. I mean, it looks clean. I mean, you know, you can either like the style or not because, you know, unless it's like perfectly screen accurate, there's always, you know, the discrepancy there. Um, but, you know, overall, the feel of it looks good. Like, you know, it doesn't look like it's super cheap or anything like that. But I can understand the idea that it doesn't quite feel you know, two hundred dollars or however much it would actually cost with shipping to your actual location. Um, so I definitely understand that. I do like the pose, like your breakdown of the pose is pretty good and that's pretty much what it looks like. So it definitely feels like it's something that, you know, could happen. Um, but yeah, for the price that it is, I mean, you know, it's it's hard to gauge cost of materials just via pictures. I mean it could be like, you know, perfectly you know smooth and everything and whatever when you actually get it and feel like a real weighted object um because you know it it does look pretty sturdy and i think most of the stuff that we've seen come out of dark horse direct um you know has been pretty good in terms of like its overall quality um and it is coming from the direct so that is also you know part of the reason why their stuff does usually cost a lot more than would say if it comes from any of the other you know sort of figures that we normally see because these are limited and they do have to factor that into it but 
in terms of actually wanting it, I definitely kind of understand why many people wouldn't want it for that price per se, um, especially if you're not like super up on you know material costs and stuff like that. So I definitely get it, but it does look cool. Yeah, I, I think for me the other problem is just like, Dark Horse Direct have done three Avatar items, and two of them have been Korra's, and they don't... Apart from un, un, until you, unless you go back to, like, what, 2012, 13, 14, they have no Korra, like, merchandise releases as such. So it's a little bit weird to see all the Korra stuff be, like, exclusive and kind of limited and, and kind of very, very pricey when you've just announced two Avatar figures, which people in general received pretty well. And it's just a case of why are you overcomplicating it? Why not just put Korra in that line and do Korra at that price point and uh, so on? But you know, it's 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 there for people. I don't inherently have a problem with like expensive statues. I just think like the second you go over like say a hundred, you need to sort of blow people away with the um, quality and the pose for the price. And this, I don't think overly impressed people and a lot of the interest was just that it's a core item and we basically don't really have any core items and um, people are still really really excited for whenever pop-up parade Korra gets announced uh hopefully in the coming days but who knows but um yeah that's there if you want it um but because it is direct they don't ship everywhere so like say ireland they don't ship to ireland even if i did want this so you know there's restrictions on top of this as well um but yeah that's uh that statue next we go to some live action avatar news and this is just uh basically some leaked set photos now it's not as revealing as you maybe think it is it's basically just some pictures of basically like oh here's what like a water tribe pillar slash staircase looks like and here's what a fire nation you know pillar looks like and I think in the background of one of the shots, you can see a, I guess, Northern Water Tribe um, character. So you get a, a brief look from a distance at what the the outfit looks like. And it is very blue. It looks very screen accurate. And it's like, okay, so far so good. But it's not revealing, I suppose, the, the most notable aspects of the show, which are like the main characters. Do they match up with what we're expecting? So it's just a case of like, okay good but it's definitely getting towards the point with this show where they probably need to say something officially soon because you know when the leaks start to come out that you probably have held off a little bit too long on uh, actually talking about <laughs> things but um what are your thoughts on now uh, what we saw in some of these leaked pictures yeah i mean like you said it does look pretty i guess you know animation accurate it definitely looks like they're using the various influence from the show to keep it on you know line in terms of that so that looks cool i mean i don't know it's, it's hard on set photos to really gauge things because things aren't always in like the perfect angle or the perfect lighting and you know this regardless of whatever we see in these leaks this isn't how it's going to look you know when we actually see the final production i mean i wouldn't expect to see camera equipment in the way of the mm. scene on some of these so you know grain of salt with that and everything but you know i guess you know it just shows that they're making progress which i guess that part is good always so mm -hmm. yeah like like the hype is kind of building a little bit like, like you can tell from some of the reaction to this stuff that like you know people are seeking out these pictures people are ready to get a decent look at this show to see what it actually is after kind of mm -hmm. so long of build-up because it was it was announced so long ago and with the whole like Mike and Brian leaving situation and everything that's happened, it's kind of gone on quite a while now. So it's about time we see some of the stuff and hopefully uh, build up to whenever it will be released, either late this year, early next year, whenever it's planned. But um, yeah, the last piece of news and the most significant piece of news is that we got the first look at uh, the dawn of Yang Chen. So... It's kind of a little bit unclear the exact details of what this is. Uh, it says, a glimpse of the prologue and the first chapter. So I'm not really clear on if this is like the full prologue and full first chapter. Especially the first, like the, the first chapter. It doesn't read like it's a full chapter of a book. Uh, it seems like a pretty small amount of text, but 
maybe they are just two kind of brief chapters to start off with. I suppose that's that's probably just the first uh, point here. Uh, what are, what are your thoughts on, on what what we're seeing here? It's it's obviously from the first two chapters of the book, but is it the f- first full two chapters? Definitely doesn't feel like that. I mean, it, it feels a bit fragmented. I guess that might be a good way to put it. I don't know. It's it's always hard with these extracts because you don't have any context for really where they are in the book or how they place in the overall story. So even you know, I don't know. Whenever I first read these, it's always like, all right, I'm trying to like figure out where things are in like terms of the story and whatnot so i don't know it's, it's kind of hard to place but i mean it gives you something so i think it's it's worth them sharing just in order to build on it oh yeah yeah the the the, the result of this is that like people are really really hyped for the book it, it confirmed a few things from the um description in terms of um there's a lot of discussion about what exactly does the description mean by, you know, plagued by the voices of avatars before her? Um, and <clears throat> I think I was on the kind of correct path with the idea of her kind of having this almost always open connection to the past avatars. And they explore that quite heavily in uh, this prologue chapter here where we have like an <clears throat> eight year old Yang Chen who's like being held down screaming in pain because she's effectively experiencing a past avatar go through the death of one of their companions and we get explained to us this dynamic where the people at the western air temple this has happened enough times where they figured out the best ways to sort of like mitigate this which is to when she has one of these sort of hallucinations hauntings or whatever way you want to call it um they have to figure out who the past avatar that Yang Chen is is talking to and if they can figure that out from history and sort of roughly try to talk as that person it sort of calms her down uh, and just helps them to figure out what the the situation is and it there seems to be a, a an element of them almost like rediscovering parts of history as well to this because they're learning all these sort of connections that past avatars had um it's a very very interesting dynamic because they don't explain like at all at least yet why this is happening as such but it's very much this like inadvertent thing she's not trying to communicate with the past avatars it's just happening to her and it's at it seems to be a complete like random um so very interesting to see where this kind of goes from here in that even when we go into the the chapter one properly they say that like it's still happening they still occurred um, and it troubles everyone around her but it, she seems to have more accepted it but uh, wh- what are your thoughts on that dynamic of, of what we learned from these two chapters about what the being plagued by the past avatars is yeah, that was pretty interesting, I thought, just the whole idea of having, you know, like you said, sort of an open connection with her past that she isn't, you know, quite in control of and how they talked about, you know, how they actually calm her down, how they find the history and how reading anything from that era is what sort of like puts her at ease even if this is sort of like a a subconscious type of thing. And then, you know, they also mentioned as well that there's, you know, some things that she mentions that they can't that they just can't figure out like there's you know stories or people that have just sort of been lost to the ages you know people who you know may have befriended the avatar or they've come across that you know maybe not have been you know quite prominent enough to get their their story told but you know of course the avatars or the past avatars would remember them um, so there's there's definitely a lot that goes with that and it should be interesting to see how that weaves in with like the larger story overall or when if she does get you know more direct control over that and i don't know it makes me wonder how many you know how many avatars back is this coming from like is this this like you know the standard like maybe say four or whatever because that's sort of what we've seen before or you know is she able to easily tap you know farther back along the line um because that you know the whole you know really interesting how that plays with her story and maybe that just you know adds to the idea of why she has so much wisdom i don't know there's there's a lot that can go with that mm, yeah th- th- there are some details here like we get explained that like apparently one of the past avatars had a 
decent relationship with Earth King Zolai, who they say here died <laughs> three centuries ago. So that puts it, like you say, kind of within that range of like the previous four avatars, uh, give or take. Um, you get some names of past avatar companions, like uh, kind of difficult to pronounce ones, Angle Urk, Preyu, Yotogawa. Um, and then notably, what everyone kind of was talking about, of course, first like prologue for the new book, new avatar out of nowhere. So um, Avatar Gun or Goon, uh, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Um, we learn a little bit about this character because this this is what's happening uh, to Yang Chen in the chapter is that she's experiencing Avatar Gun failing to hold back a tsunami that's um, coming upon this town of Ha'an, H A apostrophe A N, and their companion Maso's being killed as this is happening. So this is why Yang Chen is um, having to be held down because she's experiencing effectively the emotions of an avatar watching one of their friends die. Um, so some kind of darker things here and, and they go into this a little bit because um, the kind of main character of the prologue is Yang Chen's uh, friend I guess uh, Jetson J-E-T-S-U-N um, and she's the one ma mainly working to sort of help Yang Chen in all of this and kind of she's thinking about this whole dynamic and they, they they go into it a little bit about what must an avatar who you know fails to prevent their friend from dying um kind of feel like and this is very interesting because in the kyoshi books we do get it described to us that yang chen uh, had a few of her companions die saving her at some point during her career so i'm assuming that's kind of what we're building up to here is that you know she knows all about this from these visions, um, but it's going to happen to her as well. Um, but uh, w what are your thoughts on some of this kind of information that we get about like Avatar Gun and the details of all of this? Um, yeah, that was, I don't know, it was cool to get, I guess, a little bit more, you know, I guess, information on a past avatar through a specific situation that was you know quite traumatic for them um and you know obviously that's still going to affect young chen in a pretty direct way so if that is something that they play out in this one which it kind of seems like that's what they're going to and especially with jet sun um you know that's going to be pretty traumatic and of course that'll just pass down the line in terms of avatars so yeah that's definitely a pretty i guess i don't know cool or interesting uh, setup that they're starting right here in the beginning mm -hmm. and uh with jetson what are your thoughts on her uh how did you kind of picture her necessarily in terms of like do you think she's a like relatively young character who's maybe just a bit older than yang chen or is this just like a older character who happens to have a connection to yang chen yeah that was i don't know it i mean older I nun, more... but no more details yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder how, how, you know, what did they consider older? I mean, I don't know. It seemed like, at least when you go into the second part here, it seems more like mentor-ish. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they also related, you know, related in terms of like, you know, her older sister as well, which obviously it's not direct or they wouldn't know if it's direct, of course, but, you know, they seem to have that dynamic, um, which is cool. I mean, I think that's, you know, we sort of saw that with Aang, although, you know, with Gyatso was a lot more, you know, mature in that fact because, you know, Gyatso is a lot older. So this one, it definitely seems like, at least to me from this little bit, which, you know, there's only so much you can glean for this. It definitely seems like they're closer in age. I mean, you know, they had the whole idea of when she was uh, going to get, um, you know, the, the book or whatever in order to like to read to calm her down that you know she was a bit sort of like impatient and like made the leap without you know using her glider which someone chastised her about so you know the, that makes me feel like the character is a bit sort of younger although i don't know how much you can put into that because you know their nomads can be more playful in general so i don't know but it, it definitely doesn't seem like it's quite as old of a relationship as ang and gya so yeah, there's a few moments where like they do talk about like how oh, Jetson was sharper than she usually was with her elders, so she is not an elder at the very least. Um, and yeah. then they mentioned <laughs> that she like plays in the airball court with Yang Chen, so that I think would put it a little bit more 
within range but um still yeah like a a character who is can be a member of her team whether that be a sort of an adult member or just like older um you know kind of sister as we kind of get here is quite good but the core of the uh first chapter actual chapter one not the prologue is about yang chen at 11 so three years later trying to meditate into the spirit world for the first time guided by jetson and it works and it's this kind of big moment for yang chen because she almost feels that she i guess because of what's happening to her with the, the hauntings um that her maybe avatar powers are broken but that the fact that she meditates into the spirit world first time no problem no issue um shows her that she can work through this problem that she actually does have uh, and it's I was meant to be the kind of jumping off point for like oh maybe i can be a really good avatar so very cool stuff that we just get to see the the spirit world a little bit again and it's obviously kind of reminiscent of the the kind of Korra spirit world the way they describe it here um just very cool straight away to get the idea that okay we're going to jump in with yang chen knowing how to meditate into the spirit world and and so on so what were your thoughts on uh, the the content of the of chapter one itself? Yeah, I, I like the idea that she's able to meditate into the spirit world. I mean, it seems, you know, that's something that, you know, air nomads have more of a affinity to if they have that sort of talent. So the fact that she's able to do that and that sort of goes in line and Jitsun can also do it as well since she's the one that's leading her in there um, in this process I think that's really neat to see and I think it's I don't getting that up front here in the beginning means or at least you know makes me think that there's going to be a lot more exploration of the spirit world or at least in terms of how it relates to Yang Chen and what she has to do as an avatar or developing as an avatar um, so there's definitely a lot that can be done with that and you know they don't get too much into that but you know we can see that there's going to be some adventure there where they're going to have to figure out something um so no that's definitely pretty good to see right up front yeah because because it's interesting to sort of tie this in a little bit to what we learn about like air nomads and the spirit world in the kyoshi novels where it's kind of a rarity in that like kelsang could do it but he was seen as almost being almost an outcast for being able to do it because none of the others were so something clearly happens in a relatively short period of time being yang chen's life and then like 30 years of karok plus like 10 20 years with kiyoshi so you know give or take a hundred years and all of a sudden it seems like we go from air nomads being potentially a lot of them able to meditate into the spirit world to suddenly it's a rarity if even one of them can now we know that yang chen has interactions with spirits and she makes these deals but seems to maybe anger some along the way that more comes to pass like after her era but i'm wondering will we um explore aspects of that in that like if this maybe isn't the end of the first chapter might there be an incident in this opening chapter in the spirit world who really knows but um you know that's more of like the legacy of yang chen so i'm wondering if if we're focusing on more of a young adult um yang chen if we'll get into mm -hmm. that um but, but what are your thoughts on that some of the kind of connections we have from what we know from other material into where this seems to be going yeah i mean hmm, i wonder i mean if that's sort of going to spell like maybe the the downfall of some of the more spiritual sides i mean the other people that were in this you know um sort of you know tradition here when they were going in you know seem to understand and not even need to like you know sort of speak in order to understand the whole process of getting to the spirit world so yeah that does make me wonder if there is sort of something larger at play and i mean we know that there is a legacy so of course we're looking for cues on sort of how it fits into sort of the the bigger picture um, so that that could be something to to look out for. I mean, I, I don't. I wonder how much you know of this book is going to cover you know her life or her initial story, since we already have a bit of a a time jump right up here in the beginning. So that makes me wonder where this might lead to in the future in terms of her age and what happens across her you know her avatar journey. But there's definitely a lot that can be done there for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the last things I just want to mention is um, right towards the end, we do get a little bit of a conversation about the nature of the spirit world, at least as Jetson knows it. 
uh, Yang Chen is like, what do we do now? That's the beauty of it. We don't do anything. There is no use to the spirit world. And therein lies the great lesson. Here, you don't take, you don't anticipate or plan, you don't struggle, you don't worry about value gained and lost. You just exist like a spirit. Because we've always discussed about, like, what actually goes on in the spirit world? What do they do in there for the most part? And at least as far as Jetson is aware, <laughs> they do just exist and that's i suppose part of that kind of conflict and the difference between humans and spirits is that humans don't often like to just exist and that's all that they do whereas the spirits seem to like that um but, but what, what were your thoughts on on that line yeah no that that definitely stands out there and i don't i mean it feels like a very air nomad way of thinking of the spirit world and you know how they're sort of like, or at least attempt to be detached from a lot of things. Um, so it definitely, it feels like it's something that would be, you know, on par for, you know, an air nomad to say. Um, but of course we know, you know, from future things that, you know, the avatar has to sort of like do things. Um, they can't just sort of be passive or mm -hmm. if they are passive, sometimes that doesn't work out quite well for them. So, you know, I definitely can see how that idea can lead to some future conflicts with Yang Chen, you know, maybe with spirits, as we know, that might potentially happen, or just with, you know, her own internal struggles. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, I like the, the idea and the sentiment. Um, I just wonder how that's going to play out and, you know, if that comes into conflict with other things. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that is the uh, preview there. People definitely were, were pretty excited by this, like in learning about a new avatar, what the whole haunting dynamic is, meeting a new character, and maybe a little bit of a tease about kind of where we're going to go in that. Um, I kind of maybe latch onto the bit in the description that says, but for Yang Chen to chart her course as a singularly powerful avatar, she must rely on her own wisdom above all else. And that like, okay, I guess, is she on her own? Does she not want to have companions because of what's happened or that sort of thing? It's kind of interesting. Like, there could be some good characterization as we go on, and it makes, like, the the other character that they're teasing into the description, Kavik, seem quite interesting to see how they, they go about doing that. But, um, yeah, we, we don't have too long to go until this book is out. It's basically just, like, a little bit over a month and a half away, um, so that's uh, pretty exciting because with all the comics being delayed, this seems to be sticking to its date and is definitely going to like save the year basically in terms of new content. So exciting stuff. But uh, from there, we'll move into the first of our three episode reviews uh, that we're going to do today. So we're going to do Avatar Korra Avatar. So that means we'll start with 105, The King of Omashu. So... Um, Kind of like 104, another standalone-ish episode that kind of holds importance because of the character that it introduces more so than anything. It means that, surprisingly, there's not too much to actually talk about in terms of like a detailed analysis of this episode beyond just sort of, okay, Omashu, important location, Boomy, very important character, and a few other kind of little bits and pieces. It's a good episode. I do like it. It's like a kind of personal favorite because it's really, really funny. But we don't want this to be the sort of joke review show necessarily. Um, but it does have some importance in that Boomy gives the first hint about what the, I suppose, main plot actually should be in terms of you have to master the four elements and defeat Fire Lord Ozai. And then they'll add on to this in episode eight what the the true plot is so um there's some good stuff that comes out of this um but maybe not the most in-depth episode here but uh overall greg what were your thoughts going back to the king of omashu yeah no i i definitely can understand the sentiment of it you know maybe not having the most and i definitely do agree that it definitely is a fun episode so it's sort of like one of those episodes that if you just want to like 
watch one in isolation it definitely works for in that terms it has you know a couple sort of the the mean things that get brought up over and over again for avatar um as well as you know the introduction of uh, a fan favorite character over time um so no, i think it's it's a fun one to go back to that you don't necessarily have to think too hard about because i think you know even though you know we understand this sort of like seriousness of you know what ang has to do, you know coming back to this um i think you know in terms of the characters and the development you know like you said it, it still takes you know even still a couple more episodes for like ang to more so like maybe more so like mature to the idea of what he really has to do um despite you know still having a decent idea at this point in time mm-hmm and uh, just so, like, I suppose we're not focusing too much on, on the humor, but we don't ignore it completely. We'll just kind of have a quick thing to just go over maybe some <laughs> some of the best kind of jokes so we can kind of contain it here. Um, if I was to choose, like, two kind of standout ones, I'd go for just, like, the name, you know, Bonzu Pippin Paddleopsicopolis and June Pippin Paddleopsicopolis. I like how they bring it up at the start and then, like, later on, Boomy actually remembers it. That's kind of fun. And then I think the best like boomy joke is the whole very long thing about the chamber of like, you know, take them to the refurbished chamber. That was once bad. I, I do really like that as well. But um, what are some of the jokes that stand out the most to you from the episode? <laughs> um, I guess the one that sort of goes with one of the ones you said is just the whole idea of Kangaroo Island and sort of just uh, the crickets and Saka sort of half laughing at that or, you know, he thinks it's funny um those are always good i mean i guess you know sort of the one that i guess is a little bit more serious is you know trying to have uh take backsies um and you know his kingdom um which of course he he doesn't allow um so yeah no there's there's definitely a bunch of different jokes and funny moments and you know of course there's always the, the cabbage merchant as well which is one that even today still gets brought up and gets you know figures made of yeah, like I, I do think the cabbage merchant we we do need to talk about as its own topic because it's like the minor meme funny humor character that everyone focuses on and such a big deal is made of, um and and like we said in the last review like it's foamy mouth guy cabbage merchant back to back episodes here so like they're they're really going for the the, the comedy characters here, um cabbage merchant's interesting to me because like. The Mike Habbages and it kind of constantly coming back up is funny as a recurring gag. But I think a lot of why I latch onto it is is kind of what they've done with him in more kind of modern times of that there is a proper story to him as well. That, um, you know, by the end of the series, a large part of the Ember Island players is like, oh, comes from the knowledgeable merchant of cabbage. Um, that he has a bit of a plot point in some of the comics and that they go on to set up going into Korra Cabbage Corp with him, that they turn what could be like a, like if they overdid the whole cabbage thing, it would have become stale. So his like four or five appearances are actually still quite good. Um, but um, it's, it's more that they actually turned him into something more than that, that I actually latch on to these days. But uh, what are your thoughts on the Cabbage Merchant, given that this is his debut yeah, I mean, I think they do over the course of everything in Avatar and Korra um, and the comics, like you mentioned, they do, you know, seem to be able to evolve, you know, this sort of probably I would think they probably thought it was sort of like a throwaway gag initially. But, you know, they found a way to incorporate him more and more um, throughout the show and throughout the whole show over or the series overall. So I don't know it's, it's definitely, you know funny when you see it the first couple times from you know him not even be able to get into the city to his you know cabbages being you know destroyed and him being in the chamber sort of wanting off with their heads um i mean they even make you know a joke later on about you know lettuce leaves and all that stuff so the whole idea of the vegetables and the cabbage i guess it's just sort of a thing that they play with sometimes um but yeah no i think you know it definitely could be overdone i don't think it's you know I'm sure there's like a couple episodes that you can really, you know, think of moments where he's pretty, you know, like they use him to, to the gag effect. Um, I can think of one other one off the top really quickly. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's, 
you know, it doesn't really get in the way. I think it's the main thing. Because if it, mm-hmm. you know, came up more often than that, then it would sort of start to dilute the story. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think one of the significant things here is that most of book one is more of like a traveling show. So this time we're here in Omashu. And it is a place we only really learned the proper history of later on, like next season, 202, uh, about the whole Oma and Shu legend and like more in the ancient history, early Avatar days, that this is when the place kind of came into like huge importance because of earthbending and that the reason there's a king here as well as bossing say, and that like this is pre-bossing say we're talking about as well, we don't even know about that yet. This is like our first king we're finding out about, but that this place is sort of the historical kind of almost like leadership of the, the Earth Kingdom, even though the actual one is the leader of Bossing Se. So it's cool to just note that we've since in, in much more recent times learned about, like, say, a previous king of Omashu, a previous queen of Omashu. So it's not just Bumi, there, there, there's more to this. and. The place still stands out as being one of the more unique Avatar locations, even though the walled city Bossing Se comes up later on. Zhao Fu is also quite interesting as like the metal city. This stands out because of the the shoots, how like tall it is, and so on, um, and the, just the general like location that it is as well, kind of like built into a mountain almost. What are your thoughts on on the location here? Yeah, no, I think the location for Omashu has always stood out to people. I mean, you know, besides the fact that it is one of the first places that we get to and it has such a history with Aang, you know, being here, you know, a long, long time ago as well. Um, you know, it feels like its own location. It feels like its own place. It has, you know, like you said, it has its own history to it, even if we don't learn that for a little bit. I think you can even, you know, just from looking at it visually and sort of the, the surface level understanding you have from it from this episode you know you, there's a there's a lot to to glean from it just from you know them describing that you know how the shoots work or how there's you know their own you know forces here that might be going to war pretty soon um you know just you know the idea that they have this sort of you know unique king and he you know despite you know being able to do odd things or thinking odd ways you know seems still to be you know very respected overall um so no, i think you know in terms of location you know this will always be one of those places that stand out and would you know would be cool to have them go back to it in the future as well yeah like it, it's an interesting point there about like the the role of a mashu in a way within the war in a way, like the, it's the it's the RPG guide um, that kind of highlights this most clearly. That um, Boomy is more supplying arms to parts of the Earth Kingdom, more so than maybe like directly participating in the war. That's why you see a lot of the you know dangerous things of like mm-hmm. spears uh, on the on the shoots and stuff like that. Is that a lot of the packages that they're sending around are arms that will go on to other parts of the Earth Kingdom to keep the the war going, which I suppose we'll be talking about more when we do 106 later on. Um, but still, like it, it's cool just to have that connection, even though it's not like immediately obvious that like Omashu's at war with the Fire Nation, but you know it, it sort of is overall in the war. Um, so with that out of the way, I suppose like we have to get into to Boomy a little bit. Uh, so I suppose we'll get the whole you know mystery part of the episode out of the way here. Um, do you remember if you caught on to the idea that the flashback character was the old king straight away was it (laughs) obvious or not um i struggle with it because i I, i'm pretty sure i I remember being somewhat like oh yeah that is a a surprise but then every time i've watched it since and kind of like oh it's actually really obvious but that's coming at it with the knowledge that oh characters can live to like over a hundred I think that's what really prevents you from maybe fully committing to the Mm -hmm. idea because, wait, if this is the same guy, that means he has to be actual 112 rather than Aang sort of like technically 112. Um, But yeah, in reflection, like the whole, the the funny laugh that they have, the snorting, it does connect the dots a little bit, but uh, you don't know yet that people can live so long is my thing. But but what about you? Do you do you remember if this was a shock to you first time around? 
I don't know if I thought it was a shock, but it, no, it definitely, I don't think it was something that I expected. Um, I don't think I was, you know, paying that much attention to it. But I think, you know, like you said, it's also the age of characters. I don't think it's something that you can easily grasp from the first, you know, five episodes. Um, you know, especially with what Boomy actually does in this episode, like that, you know, from, you know, your normal understanding of how people work and how they age that doesn't seem like something they would have to do um be able to do but of course you know now looking back in this and understanding everything with the avatar world and how characters work and you know with kyoshi and everything like that like that that doesn't even seem you know that that crazy at this point um so no i mean it definitely seems plausible um but i don't think i thought of that the first time at least mm. Yeah, and another one I latched onto in relation to this is that in the fight when he says uh, typical airbender tactic, avoid and evade, it's kind of like, oh, how does he know about typical airbender tactics given that apparently yeah. <laughs> the world hasn't seen airbenders in the hundred years? He he technically does know because he's from Aang's era where the nomads did travel and Aang literally says he was went to Omashu multiple times. So um, that's how he knows because <laughs> he is Aang's friend and has interactions with with airbenders in an era where they were around so that's a that's a nice line that's kind of quite subtle in there to show that oh he has he's probably one of the few people in the world who have experience fighting airbenders probably the only actually and um, so that that's an interesting point as well um the i suppose the, the main plot of the episode is obviously the three challenges um which are of course basically key in a waterfall get it out um find his pet Flopsy, um, just a little bit of a mystery between like expectations, and then choose someone to fight if you win, you know, that's the the final challenge. Um, it's obviously meant to test Aang, and inadvertently it's kind of, it's Boomy messing with Aang, but also wanting to see kind of where he's at a little bit, um, and that's a fun dynamic at the end. And it's just meant to make Aang think about things from a different perspective, like a mad genius. Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, the three challenges as the main action of the episode? <laughs> I think the the action bits in this are pretty good. I mean, I think it, it flows pretty well from challenge to challenge. You get to see and, you know, become increasingly, you know, sort of frustrated with the challenges before he has to guess, you know, who Boomy actually is. Um, but no, I, I like the challenges. I think, I don't know, I think they're fun, you know, they are, you know, dangerous. They do have, you know, some of that element to them, but, you know, they they do serve a purpose, which is, you know, what Aang eventually does learn at the end. And I don't, it's, it's a point to make of, like, seeing where Aang is, I guess, in his, you know, development, I guess, is sort of, you know, the idea what Boomy is testing to see, you know, how, how ready is for, you know, what's going to come up in the future, which I think even still, like, you know, Aang isn't quite, you know, fully ready at this point, but at least he has, like, a direct idea of what he has to do and how he has to go about it. Um, it's just sort of, you know, getting all the pieces in place for him to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have to have a discussion about the fight here because it's, it's definitely, I think, the most notable part of the episode. It's one of the better fights in early <laughs> Avatar because it's it's the definition of, like, an earthbender versus an airbender because they're both sort of, like, the like ideal sort of practitioners of each. So you get to see the style of both pretty much perfectly here with a slight caveat that kind of Boomy is a bit more creative as an earthbender than most. Um, but still, it, it's still really, really uh, good. Um, and there's just great scenes highlighting, you know, Aang's dodging, um, how he can build up tornadoes and the like, that earthbenders can do small scale attacks, like kind of rapid fire or go for the big heavy attacks also, plus stuff like the, the kind of uh, quicksand, um, as well. Even his little thing he does after the fight where he just kind of collapses into the ground and appears somewhere else. Very, very clever overall. And uh, one of the moves I noticed here that I thought was very unique that I maybe hadn't noticed before was um, right after Aang gets out of the situation where you think he's going to be killed, Boomy does this very cool move where like, he sucks almost the, the boulder back to himself by like breathing in. I don't think we've ever really seen like an earthbender do that kind of before of like you're used to seeing them send earth out, but kind of like 
pulling it back in especially such a big boulder was uh pretty impressive especially because he had to do the whole like breathe in kind of type thing uh, and he brought it in with quite a bit of force also so uh it ends in a tie with the idea that boomy has the advantage in how it ends but he treats it as like oh ang's impressed enough that he pushed me this far but uh what are your thoughts on this earth versus air fight yeah I- <laughs> It definitely has a feel of like they're both really, really, you know, proficient and masters at their element. Um, Boomy is definitely, I mean, he does do some of your sort of, you know, what you would consider, I guess, almost sort of like standard, you know, earth bending techniques. But the way that he goes about them definitely feels more unique in his sort of like, you know, mad genius sort of idea. Um, even if, you know, some of his, you know, he does some of the classic things like just trying to pick up things, but he also, you know, or just trying to like launch up boulders. Um, but he also does some things like, you know, creating like a slapping sort of like landslide of ground, which Mm. that definitely feels more, I guess, unique in terms of abilities or just the fact that, you know, earth is used in that sort of, you know, flexible manner rather than just, you know, pulling the rocks or shooting rocks around and that sort of thing so you definitely can see you know Bumi has the those abilities as well as just overall strength like you no know, the reason why Aang created tornadoes because Bumi you know basically lifted up like a huge chunk of you know the arena that they're in in order to you know throw at him which you know in the grand scheme of things doesn't seem like it really would work that well but you know of course Bumi's Part of this is just him sort of like testing Aang in general just to see what he would do. So I don't even know if he would have expected that to really, you know, do anything. But, you know, just to see how Aang responded to it is enough to sort of, you know, get a grasp of what, you know, Aang's able to do at this point. Yeah, like, like, like yeah, the tornado, giant move from Aang to redirect Boomy's big attack. But I like that Boomy, like, he panics a little bit, but ultimately it's just like sticks his hands out and carves straight through the thing like that's how powerful he is that's like this thing coming at him with a bit of force he's just like yeah get the knife out cut it in half like it's just uh really really powerful because like in in reflection like you realize that oh like boomy has ordered white lotus so he he's incorporating like aspects of almost all forms of bending in here because he has that sort of understanding so that create creativity of like there are little bits and pieces here where it kind of feels like, oh yeah, that's almost like a bit of a water bending kind of flow to to the earth in this scene. And um, mm-hmm. there's maybe a little bit of a kind of firebender thing in how he fires the the rocks out and uh, so on. So like it, it it's it's nice to kind of realize in reflection that like this guy's like ten levels above Haru, who we meet in the next episode, who is still quite a good earthbender. That this guy is 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 absolutely brilliant and that. Like he's one or two, uh, absolutely on everyone's like bending list, uh, with only Toph really going up against them. So, very very notable. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything else? Um, like Sokka and Katara don't have like that much to do. They're mainly trapped in the the Genomite, the Creeping Crystal, the whole time. The the reveal that it's rock candy at the end is is quite good. I think it's in that like they were nearly killed by you know a food item basically but um you know for the most part it's very focused on ang boomy these challenges and then like i said he ang does learn that ultimately to accomplish his goal he has to defeat someone called fire lord ozai and that's us finding out about that for the first time and that uh in a reference that comes back in the finale Boomy oddly focuses in on Momo, uh, that like, oh, you'll need Momo too. Um, so that's interesting as well, that they, they, they come back to that as well. But uh, are there any other final points from this episode you want to bring up? Uh, no, I think that's it. I mean, I think, you know, overall, it's sort of a pushing, you know, the story forward type of episode where, you know, you understand where things are hopefully going but you still don't have you know the full context Mm -hmm. yeah and and then just like really quickly like um in terms of omashu and like where it is on the map it is more in like the southern half but like it is relatively close to the middle of the world as well so they actually do make quite a bit of progress here and it kind of highlights that like 
We're only five episodes in and we're basically halfway there. Like they really do slow down sort of uh, going forward. So um, it's just an interesting kind of thing to note that everyone will bring it up that once we get to book three, we're traveling like halfway across the world in one episode. Um, but it takes like an entire season to get to the Northern Water Tribe. It's it's quite interesting. And uh, yeah, no Zuko in this episode as well. That's that's interesting. Um. We'll cut over to Korra here for our one Korra review for this time out, and that is Korra's episode five, which is The Spirit of Competition. So this is the one that is widely regarded as being like the, the worst book one episode. It's the shipping episode. It's the one everyone has issues with because of that and how drama focused it is. It's it's a weird one because I ultimately like agree with the idea that I think it is the weakest book one episode, but I still think it's quite good. Like I don't I don't think the shipping stuff just inherently brings it down so much that it's terrible. I think they actually managed to write a pretty well done episode incorporating the shipping drama into the uh, the pro bending dynamics, and it makes for a kind of fun episode, especially because it's kind of for the most part all dealt with here we don't come out of this episode with the drama still going on there's aspects of it that we see in the coming episodes but it is mostly dealt with here and then we get around to more just a few scenes to put the pieces in place for the where the ships are at the end of the book um it still does highlight that their approach was very drama centric when it came to shipping here and it felt like, in a way, a response to, like, oh, hey, shipping was a big thing in Avatar. What if we make that a thing instead of it sort of just happening naturally? And I think that kind of created some of the uh, bad dynamics in, in terms of the relationships for the first two seasons that they had to, they pretty much had to just wipe it all out, start again, uh, and fix it going into, like, book three, four. At least that's my impression on it, because they had to move away from what was here very drama centric stuff but uh the action side of the episode i think is quite good it's it's definitely like with pro bending it takes them having more of a story to the match these are a lot of sort of just montage -y ones and maybe the action isn't amazing but i like how the dynamic changes as the shipping stuff changes but uh, what are your thoughts overall on this episode yeah, I mean, I don't know. I definitely don't think I have as much, you know, hate or issues with it as compared to other people, just because, you know, it does sort of push through it. And I think, you know, part of it might just be because of how, you know, the original, you know, idea or production of the show is going to be. And, you know, maybe it would have made sense to get it all done mostly in this episode, even though we do still see remnants of it later on, um, as, as opposed to sort of like, you know, having, you know, a four season, three season, you know, two season development for a relationship and then having it sort of, you know, come to pass or not come to pass. Um, but it does add an interesting dynamic. Like you said, it does sort of, you know, play off a certain way that, you know, if you're into the pro bending is a nice way to see how it's sort of reflecting their sort of emotions and their mental state. So it's a good, you know, barometer for that, from that aspect, if you do like that part of the episode, but I definitely can understand if, you know, you're not a particular fan of, you know, having the relationships go and back and forth and there being love triangle and everything like that, that, that can definitely be a bit sort of like, you know, annoying to you. Mm hmm. But yeah, let's get into this. Um, I want to open this up with uh, two sort of back-to-back -back scenes that are basically uh, guy talk followed by girl talk, which sort of set the tone for the episode uh, in terms of like <laughs> what we actually do. So guy talk is Bolin and Mako talking, and we see that um, Bolin is actually quite open about his interest in Korra and is basically kind of saying, hey, Mako, what do you think if I ask Korra out? Amako warns Bolin against it, partly because, you know, of the whole, we're a team, don't add drama into the team dynamic, or it will affect things. But then there's also a part of that is that, don't do that, Bolin, because I also kind of have conflicted feelings about 
like I like Korra too, but I'm in the relationship with Asami. So it's this kind of like um kind of half and half thing where he's actually quite wise about it on one side, but there's maybe a little bit of selfishness in it as well. Um but it's it's interesting because I don't think there's an inherently a problem with like Mako having feelings for Asami and Korra. Um, at least like at this point like up to this point I don't think there's really a problem with that in that he doesn't ultimately stop Bolin from doing what he does going forward and is sort of proven correct to a certain degree as we go forward but um, it's it's definitely a, a, an interesting uh, scene that we have here so what are your thoughts on, on the guy talk that we get here? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, Marco has a little bit of a, a conflict of interest there. But like you said, his his idea there of, you know, just sort of how it can create, you know, internal conflict within the team is definitely spot on. You know, of course, he unfortunately becomes directly involved with, you know, that sort of conflict there. So, you know, maybe he should have been more aware of it later on. But, of course, those things are, are hard to manage. Um, but, no, I, I think it's you know, a good way of seeing the brothers sort of communicate here in the beginning about you know not being you know completely like sure on this to where to actually end up in the later part of the episode where they're you know more or less able to sort of get over this as well Mm -hmm. and with the girl talk we initially have Korra talking to Jinora and Iki and them just kind of wanting to hear the scoop on what's going on in Korra's love life and she's kind of really awkward about it it's clear she doesn't have like much experience with this um and she actually asks them for advice. And so they're quite young here. They give the kind of really obvious advice of like, oh, I read in the books to be like super dramatic about it. And Iki's all sort of sunshine and rainbows about it. And Korra's kind of like, uh, what? That's like either side of the scale. But then Pema comes in and gives advice that makes all the girls kind of be like, oh, romance exists and is real. But sets Korra on this path to actively want to disrupt Mako and Asami's relationship it's like Pema is actually like a kind of bad influence in what advice she actually gives here and it's it's obviously she's happy because I suppose she like won her kind of romantic feud with uh, Lin as we find out later um but in this case to Korra who doesn't have a lot of experience Pema basically just saying oh yeah, if you care and the person you're interested in is already in a relationship, just go for it. Just just like get in the middle like and try and win. And Korra does exactly just that. So I think people almost forget with this episode that it's kind of it's kind of Pema who initiates a lot of the, the drama here. I, I, lo- I really like the scene, but um, it, it's uh, Pema caused a lot of this, definitely. But, but your thoughts on this one? Yeah, no, it, it is, you know, kind of her fault. And, you know, later on in later episodes, we do see her sort of, like, become aware that she sort of caused this issue and has to sort of, like, back out of it. But, you know, the idea that, you know, Cora isn't quite, you know, knowledgeable in this as she's, you know, pretty much grown up more or less in sort of, like, isolation in terms of, you know, interacting with people her own age, um, you know, you can kind of, you know, understand her not quite, you know, getting how, you know, this might work. Um, and, you know, this is sort of just like her character in general is just sort of like going for it. It just happens to be in this case, going for it doesn't quite work out. Yep. But uh, what's the next part of this episode you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just sort of start getting into just sort of the how they're, you know, sort of doing in the matches in general, or just the idea of this, you know, tournament. I mean, I think, you know, I know pro bending, you know, it's kind of either like you like it or you don't like it. But you know, I think in terms of, you know, this early part of the season before we really get into sort of like the crux of things, you know, it works, you know, for the most part pretty well in terms of like pushing, you know, this team, you know, our new avatar group uh, together, even though this episode specifically kind of divides them. Hmm. Yeah, the the action in this one is, is, is interesting because they don't do anything particularly clever, I would say, with a lot of the choreography in these fights, whereas it is kind of just a big montage of Mako shoots a fireball, Korra shoots some water, Bolin throws a disc, and the show getting hit, dodged. Um, 
there's a little bit as we go through kind of more highlighting like the dynamics as we go on of like after Kor and Mako's fight they bump into each other after Bolin and Mako are at odds with each other like Mako kind of <clears throat> accidentally shoots Bolin in the back uh, Bolin is kind of uh, ill going into the final fight so he 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 gets sick he takes a shot to the shoulder but again it's I understand maybe the the sense with this episode of saying that the action scenes in the pro bending are not like stand out from any sort of a, like choreography drama perspective because the first match against the Red Sands Rabaroos is basically just <clears throat> the teamwork is amazing they win all three rounds no problem and there's no real standout they're all just working really well there's a few nice scenes maybe highlighting just say like Mako like does a flip over Bolin and, and, and little things like that that just show the teamwork but they're maybe a little few and far between um so in that sense like I think the earlier showings of pro bending and then what we'll see in the next episode are definitely better and if you were to do like a pro bending focused show you'd have to I think do quite a bit of work to make the choreography of each fight feel unique and not just feel like every character's throwing the same shot every single time they uh, do an attack um but it is good i do like how the dynamic works when at the start everyone thinks the the romance stuff is going well so the teamwork is on point bolin is amazing in the second match because he's just had the good date he feels with cora uh, but Cora and Mako are at, at odds with each other because they had their bad conversation. And then the team works terrible in the last match because everything has gone wrong. But Cora knows that it's going wrong and wants to kind of keep the team going in the tournament. And so she has the desire to kind of win. That In that sense, like that's where it works. And the writing actually comes together quite well. But uh, it's maybe not the greatest showcase of kind of pro bending in the sense that we know that these teams do actually have sort of unique styles and personalities and it doesn't quite come out necessarily i'd say the porcupines feel a little bit interesting because they at least say they're veterans but i maybe wished they had incorporated the whole idea of that's toza's team and maybe included him a little bit here just because like mm. toza could have given them advice going in or something but uh, what are your thoughts on how they do the matches yeah, I mean, I definitely get the idea that they are more sort of montage in terms of, you know, trying to, I guess, get through them to get to sort of the more of the, the story bits or the, the relationship bits in these ones. Um, I mean, there are some other, you know, highlight moments when sort of Bolin has the whole sort of like grappling with the other teams, sort of the sudden death at the end of the episode. I think that sort of stands out in terms of like new rule sets, if you want to say, for the actual uh, pro bending. Um, but yeah, they do sort of, you know, push you through them just to show how their mental state is in each of the, the matches like you mentioned which i think is it's pretty cool just to see how that plays into them since you know you know that that can affect you either you know either good or bad as they show here um but yeah i mean i think i don't know i like the idea that they're just showing the tournament and sort of this sort of like a fast pass way to just sort of get you to see sort of that this is going to be a really big thing that's sort of a, a lead up for the next episode mm, yeah you, you mentioned the tiebreaker there like that yeah that, that that's probably the main kind of new thing we learn about pro bending of like oh yeah if a round ends in a tie flip a coin you choose one element and you have like a duel on the raised platform and grappling is now allowed which is actually very very cool and they needed to do this because they have a tiebreaker in the next match with uh, Cora and Tano. So um, it's cool that there's at least the setup so you know what that is. Um, so yeah, that's the pro bending. Um, I suppose we have to get into some of these uh, drama scenes here. So um, after Pema's advice to Cora, she does try to ask Mako out. And Mako's trying to kind of handle it nicely and kind of like avoid the situation here. Um, but... Um, Cora then like doubles down and is just like oh I really like it when we go out and he's and Mako's sort of forced to maybe be a little harsher than he maybe wants to be and just be like no sorry I, I'm not interested and it's a really awkward scene and you can tell like Mako's not being kind of fully honest but like Cora like forced him to have to like be like really kind of 
clear cut about it at this point. So, you know, there's there's a lack of communication here, but like a lot of this is on like, oh yeah, Cora's just like asked out someone who's already dating someone, which is obviously like the core problem here. Um, and then in the aftermath of this, um, Bolin asks Cora out and she's like, no, because she's upset about what happened with Mako. He compliments her and she gets a little bit giddy and then eventually says yes. Um, and again, I, I think it serves to highlight, you know, like some of like Cora's kind of lack of a kind of experience here, I guess. Um, but you could see the setup here for the drama coming like a, a mile off that Mako and Cora aren't aren't being fully truthful with each other in terms of communicating well and then you can tell that Bolin really likes Korra but she doesn't really feel the same about Bolin um, and they kind of have different expectations in a way like going into their date so all these kind of problems coming up but uh, what were your thoughts on um, <laughs> this scene Korra asking uh, Mako out here? Yeah, I mean, this, you know, like we said before, it really just shows that Cora doesn't really understand the situation because, you know, that for a lot of people that would seem like as like a big no-no to even attempt to do, but Cora, you know, it's sort of just her personality and her character is just sort of trying to go for it in a way that, you know, she's been advised, at least currently, um, but, you know, maybe she should have told Pema a little bit more of the situation before going with it, but, you know, it definitely, you know, I think, like you said, you can definitely see where this is going here, and I don't know, it makes me wonder, like, where was Bolin when this part of it was going, or was he just not paying attention to sort of, you know, key in on this, or maybe not do it, but, you know, he does ask her out as well, and they do actually go on their sort of date as well. Yeah, and, and their date, date is kind of interesting because they do actually get on very well. But kind of as it's sort of said in like the dialogue, Korra more just wants to have some fun, kind of almost like getting over the <laughs> the Mako kind of shutdown. Whereas Bolin full on thinks this is like their first date type thing, whereas I don't think Korra necessarily fully views it like that. Um, but, you know, they... They, it highlights their dynamic as, as friends as well, so, so that you get that also. Because uh, again, these two met first, like from the first, from the second episode, um, and we saw a lot, a little bit of that dynamic from the second episode kind of come out here as well, especially when <clears throat> Tano and the Wolf Bats arrive. So this is where we see them, and I like that again. You see the kind of maybe slight cowardly aspect of Bolin, the fact that he's not super confident when it comes to these confrontations we saw that with Amon we see it here with the wolf bats that he can't really bring himself to stand up to them but Korra doesn't have any problem with that so uh, Tano comes in and immediately is trying to intimidate them but Korra uses Naga to scare him off so she's actually quite clever about that there so she doesn't get in too much trouble um but uh yeah he's just he, he's just got across Tano as just this uh, kind of snake-like character who uh you're meant to just hate going into their eventual match that these are the former champions and yeah not great um but what are your thoughts on the the bowling cora date yeah i mean like you said their their date definitely goes really well like they you can see that they have a connection you know a friendship at the very least um despite you know how one might take it a little bit more than the other um but yeah they they have like you know a really good time as they do mention later on that you know this was a really good outing from them in general and you know the idea that she's able to use naga just adds a little bit more you know sort of levity to the moments as well mm -hmm. um this brings us to the next Mako Korra co confrontation in a way. Um, Mako confronts Korra about the, the date with Bolin. And again, similar to kind of before, there's half the concerned about the sort of dating within the team happening. And then half concerned about how that maybe affects his own maybe relationship with Korra at, at some point. Um, and they basically get into an argument here where they both kind of like accuse each other of almost like you really like me uh no you really like me type thing without fully saying it the other way around um and like 
you know it's very drama focused when Cora says the line, when you're with her, you're thinking about me. And it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're really going for the drama here for sure. Um, but yeah, the, they just kind of storm off pretty much after this point, uh, not really on the same page at all, which leads into the second match where Bolin you know, is like the man of the match, wins the tiebreaker, but these two have terrible chemistry in that match. But uh, what are your thoughts on this quite uh, really, probably like the first full-on drama scene from the episode? Yeah, I think this is probably the one for a lot of people where they were like, okay, this might be a bit much for, for me. I mean, it it feels like something that fits like what they're going through um, at that moment. Um, but, you know, it's like across the line moment, especially for like Mako at this point. So you can understand why they're not able to sort of like function at all in the match um, in terms of like, you know, their t- sort of team dynamics. So it uh, is understandable, but it definitely can be a bit much, I think. Yeah. And I think the other problem with this is that um, Asami is not really in this episode much. And so they develop Makora so much while Mako is still with Asami and it just makes it feel like oh like Mako and Asami's relationship is basically just literally a plot point to get to Mako and Korra because outside of like one or two scenes like you don't get too much on like their chemistry together and so it's maybe a little bit difficult to get into like Mako's kind of headspace about like where is the conflict when we know why he likes Korra, but the Asami thing just sort of happened, like literally fell into it, crashed into it. Um, again, maybe it would have made the episode even more drama focused if Asami was actually in here and involved. Um, but at least it would have given you more of like, OK, this is what Mako's conflict kind of actually is. Otherwise, it just feels like like Asami, like when she turns up, it's like, oh, wait, yeah, yeah she exists and she is actually in a relationship with Mako and you kind of almost forget that in certain scenes because she's not really around and I get it like we haven't really formed team avatar yet Asami is more like associated with the team more than part of the team at this point but um what are your thoughts on that in this the relationship episode Asami is only sort of minorly involved yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wonder if that would have helped to clarify things or if that would hurt, you know, the whole situation because you have to spend more time on her character in sort of like the relationship dynamic here. I mean, we see her like a little bit in the beginning and we can see that chorus just sort of like and eh, with her as a character and they have a couple other moments where, you know, especially more, I guess, mainly at like the end where, you know, Cora thinks, you know, Asami for, you know, letting them you know basically be able to be in the tournament and asami has like a little bit of a you know like a facial expression response to that but not much so no you really don't understand this i mean i wonder if they would have shown more of their relationship early on you know specifically with like core and like the vicinity or whatever would that have come off cross better to core that they are in a relationship that she shouldn't just dive into things or maybe it wouldn't even have mattered to her anyway yeah i think it just it, it leans into what tends to happen a lot with asami in the entire series is that they are very quick to sideline her when they don't feel like they immediately need to use her and so it'll be interesting to see how, how many times that kind of happens but um from there we get our next mako Korra talk so this is after the match Mako does come out and basically tries to address from their previous conversation the idea of like, look, it is confusing. I do like you, but obviously you basically, but he, he, he doesn't even get a chance to fully finish what he's saying. He's basically trying to say, I like you, but I like Asami. I'm confused. I, uh, I don't know necessarily what to do. And Korra more or less just reacts to like, oh, he said he liked me and just kisses Mako he does kiss back for a moment they then sort of you know argue and we get a little bit of the oh you kissed back type situation 
And then we cut to the most like hashtag drama thing ever. Bo- they turn around, Bolin is there, he's carrying some flowers, bursts into tears, runs off, super upset, and the team has sort of fallen apart. The team has absolutely imploded here due to uh, romance drama. Um, this is this is the scene that everyone will cite. Um, and I, I, I think for me, what, what's probably the worst about this is that it's it's not just that the scene is drama focused, but it's also that the show itself goes on to not even almost like reference this scene correctly in that it's almost forgotten in the history of the show that Korra initiates the kiss with Mako. Whereas when they reflect on this scene, this is treated as the like, oh, Mako cheated on Korra um, type thing in like remembrances and so on. Um, so it's it's a weird one, but it's like Korra is the one causing all the drama here. In like because of Pema, but it's it's Korra initiating basically all of this. Uh, yet it is Mako who comes out worse from the end of this, even though it is I think mostly on Korra. Um, what are your thoughts on this uh, historic scene? Yeah, it definitely. I don't. Know, I think it's funny how over time this scene. Or just, you know, the whole relationship in general gets sort of, like, twisted with who did what first and, you know, who's at fault for, you know, the relationship or trying to push it too fast, too early and everything like that. So, I don't know. I mean, it definitely does get referenced so much. I mean, and, you know, I guess, you know, it's kind of funny because you can see how Bowen reacts to this and, you know, sort of the, the end result with him sort of being drunk on noodles and everything like that. But, um... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just another instance of Korra just trying to go for it, but not really, you know, sort of understanding how these sort of things work, which, you know, to her, you know, credit, she, why would she really, you know, have that much experience with this? But she's learning the hard way, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, from here, yeah, we, we get the brief scene, Bolin drunk on noodles, Mako just comes in. Uh there's not too much to discuss here just that bowling calls him like a brother betrayer and stuff like that um but mako effectively has to drag bowling to the arena so this is where we get the whole fire ferrets versus buzzard wasps uh bowling gets sick in the match um he gets like eliminated during one of the rounds um he gets injured and it leads up to the scene like one of the few kind of dialogue scenes during the the pro bending stuff which is Bolin and Mako are really down. They think the tournament is over. They've lost the first two rounds. They don't really have a chance. The team just isn't working whatsoever. Korra tries to get them going here. She still has hope despite the drama, but the brothers have basically resigned themselves to the loss. And so, you know, it sets up the situation pretty quickly. The brothers get eliminated and it's Korra three versus one and and we, we see what happens from there. Um, but uh, what were your thoughts on on that? The, just the, the brothers, the ones who are like the, the main members of the team, they're the ones down on this, and it's actually Korra who has the hope. Yeah, I mean, someone always has to have the hope, right? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, just the whole situation for the brothers, you know, with them... It's just not working at this point and they really have to sort of like figure it out and this is definitely one of their like sort of like low moments in terms of you know working together of course they do pretty quickly recover from this but you know it just highlights that this is sort of like their breaking point i guess yeah and <clears throat> what is interesting about it is that the scene of kind of fixing the dynamic between the brothers is so quick brief and to the point that they're just like, Bolet Mako is just like, hey, is your shoulder okay? Yeah, and it's like, are we going to be okay? And it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're brothers. We're going to get through this regardless of how kind of like crazy things are. And that's it, really. And it just kind of, I suppose, serves to highlight that. Uh, I suppose, yeah, like a lot of this is just that hashtag drama. It's not actually that all these characters hate each other. It's just awkward and weird and that it's not going to get in the way of them. And it's almost silly that they nearly lost the match over this stuff so they go up in the elevator and they see Korra get the 3v3v1 knockout um very cool kind of action sequence here because they they very clearly sort of manufacture the idea of like Korra 
attacking in such a way that lines up all of them in each zone and then um how they animate the the kind of finishing blow with the idea that it has to be within the rules but a big enough attack that it like wipes three people out um just highlighting that oh yeah you still do a finisher in pro bending you just have to be like very kind of uh quick with uh, your kind of power attack um very very cool to see there um but uh yeah what, what were your thoughts on the the brothers talk and Cora's hat trick yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, the, the idea that they're able to recover this from quickly, I mean, it probably just speaks to them, you know, just growing up with each other and just sort of, you know, dealing with problems and only having each other to rely on that they're able to sort of, you know, pretty much recover from this pretty quickly. Um, like, you know, there's not too much more that needs to be be said. They just need to understand that this is just like a weird thing that they just happen to be involved with suddenly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the idea with Cora and the hat trick, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think from the angle that they show it at, it makes it seem, you know, a pretty, like a pretty strong attack, which according to what we understand, like there are, you know, posing rules or whatever so that you can only, you know, use water for up to a certain length of time. So, you know, I think it feels like it could be, you know, almost over the limit, but that could just be because of the perspective that they show it at. But the idea of that being the way that they win, I think is definitely pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, because the, the, the rules of programming, though, it's worded, is that, like, if you stream water at someone for more than a second, it's a hosing foul. But it's like, I guess with Cora here, it's just that she she does the biggest possible thing of water that she can fire at that speed. And it's more about just the pure velocity of the attack that it obviously goes through the person and doesn't last a second, but has enough power to like, just force them all back. So um, it, it's definitely interesting. Um, I, I, I actually really would like to see some pro bending focused stories kind of highlighting the training that they do and like, you know, what are the best attacks to knock people back? Because there are definitely some times when it feels like, oh, a character takes a direct hit, but it doesn't knock them back. And then there are other times when it's like a a kind of looping earth disc just sends Bolin like hurtling back like he's been hit by a, like a bazooka or something like that. It's um, it, it can be a little bit weird at times, but um, still like a r- really cool moment. Cory gets a hat trick. Mako got a hat trick in the the first pro bending episode. And after this, it's kind of like the Mako Bolin scene but with the three of them here they just kind of all agree that like okay things are a bit awkward but uh we're gonna be okay we're gonna get through this it's it's not gonna be easy but you know we'll get through the awkwardness and it's kind of just like almost like an agreement between them to just without saying it to not like they do in this episode actively try to sort of almost like pursue each other (laughs) temporarily um and that's kind of what happens as the episodes progress. Like, Bolin isn't trying to ask Korra out. Korra isn't actively pursuing uh, Mako. And Mako goes back to focusing on Asami. And it's just, okay, we'll see where we go from here. Uh, so it's so interesting that in a very drama-focused episode, it's quite a realistic kind of resolution at the end, which is a large part of why I don't, like, hate the episode, because... Yes, we have a lot of drama in the middle, but we get back to normal pretty quickly in that, you know, it it is only a handful of scenes that address the romance after this. And a lot of it is more kind of on almost a Sammy after this point, as she's finally brought into the romance drama. But uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of resolution to the drama here? Yeah, I mean... It does wrap it up pretty well. There are more scenes to it, but I think they definitely seem to come to an understanding. And, you know, when Cora does heal uh, Bolin, which I think that's sort of like the first instance that we learn about that, I think, you know, they recognize that they do, you know, work well together, that they do have fun. So, you know, you can see that there's more of a, a understanding of where they stand in terms of their overall friendship um there's still more to be said um and there are you know more instances where there's a little bit more conflict but i don't think there's as much to this level um except for maybe one or two other times Mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a lot more subtle this episode people highlight on it because 
it has the big three super dramatic moments lines like when you're with her you're thinking about me we've got the you know mistaken kiss situations and so on uh people getting drunk on noodles because of the results of different scenes it's not to that extreme as we go on but there's a few little like side eyes and stuff like that as we go on um the only other scene is then just really quick um right before the apology scene happens the wolf bats go out for their match the apology scene finishes and the wolf bats are done with their match and they've put their opponents in the hospital so just a teaser for the next episode that oh i guess the wolf bats are very aggressive they're skilled good but they're also dangerous and uh, as we find out it's more that they cheat and obviously dangerous attacks is part of that but i don't think there's too much necessarily to talk about there otherwise that basically is the episode um it's like i said i i still would rate it as my weakest of the 12 but not that it's wildly far off the the back of the other ones it's just that the romance stuff is probably the weakest aspect of book one and probably cora in general uh, and this is the one where there's the the most of that but it's still it's still pretty good like it's still there's still a lot of depth to the scenes here the character dynamics it's just uh not exactly what we want uh i always say about the the romance stuff is that if you're going to do romance what i want to see is developing that specific romance why are these two characters in a relationship what does that change with them and i think cora almost took the approach of what if we chop and change it a lot and what if this creates drama between the characters rather than oh, Mako and Asami are in a relationship, so let's use that to develop those two. Instead, it feels like Mako being in a relationship with Asami is a way to create drama with Korra, uh, that that type of thing. Uh, and that the actual relationships don't mean much because it's just to get us to the next one. And it feels like that's kind of the way it is right up until the end of book two. Um but uh i suppose just for some final thoughts on on the, on the romance um looking kind of forward to where it goes um what what are your thoughts on on sort of the romance uh, as it is for most of cora <laughs> that's funny because yeah because when you think about when things or how things end up in the end it's sort of like i don't know it makes it kind of funny looking back on some of these earlier ones how you know it seemed like you know, it was going to be, you know, the Macora ship or anything like that or with Bolin and where it actually ends up. I don't know. It's it's definitely, you know, not something you sort of particularly see, at least not in these initial episodes. Of course, we know how the show was being made and produced that that necessarily wasn't fully in sight potentially at this time. Um, but, yeah, it is, you know, something to think about early on because that's definitely, you know, they're still sort of figuring out things as well as the characters themselves are still figuring out things. So I guess in that terms, it kind of makes a bit of sense. Mm -hmm. So we move on to our last episode review, which is back to Avatar. So uh, 106 Imprisoned. Um, this is an interesting episode. Like uh, watching it again, it is very, very good in that it's almost like a plot point I wish they had addressed more over the course of Avatar. And that is the effectively the earthbender uprising that we get here and it's interesting that like i don't think we ever see any evidence of like the result of this episode basically that tyro and the others are planning to go back to their village retake it and then sort of in a way inspire others to do the same the last airbender movie actually sort of expands on this concept and shows that a little bit does a bit of a montage um highlighting that oh yeah as they travel through the Earth Kingdom, they do inspire people. The return of the Avatar moments, like basically its version of the imprisoned thing happens and it goes on. Here, we don't necessarily see that. And I think we talked about this in like our first Avatar episode reviews, but that they don't focus too much on the war full stop. And it's almost a surprise when you actually see like, oh, this is what the Fire Nation is doing. That's what they're doing. It feels like it's almost like a coin flip at times as to if they go to a new place and if they want it to be taken over by the Fire Nation or not. In that, Omashu, not now. Um, this imprisoned town, 
yes, it's under the control of the Fire Nation, and then other places we go, it's just not uh, at all. Um, definitely a, a one of the few situations, I think, in Avatar of just like a major plot point that just could have been done a little bit better. I get we have to sort of move on because we're kind of like a traveling show for the time being. Um, but it is very weird to see that scene from Tyro at the end and never mm -hmm. return to it. Otherwise, like, Haru is a fine, if sort of a little bit uninspired, interesting character, like, minor character. It's a good Katara character focus episode, though I think we get better ones as the series goes on. Um, and it's just very, very solid without being one of my, like, favorite book one episodes. So, you know, still rated quite nicely it's just uh you know not one of the best but what are, you, what are your overall thoughts on 106 yeah i mean it's i don't know i think it feels like it has or that it should have more importance to the overall sort of storytelling and world development of the avatar world but it's still you know early days in this series that it doesn't quite have you know the tone attached to it that you know you might think that it should have considering that you know this is a town that's being controlled by foreign power and you know part of that could just because of the style of the show and that is for kids that that's not something that they're going to dwell on that much in the beginning here um but you know the idea that like you said that it almost seems like it's sort of like 50 50 chance of whether it's going to be more serious or not serious you know kind of leads you to sort of you know i guess question that a bit so maybe it's just sort of the the inconsistency that sort of makes you wonder if they would have gone all one way or another um but you know i definitely think that the the concepts that are brought up in this and that you know sort of give you the idea of that there is a war going on not everyone's in sort of like the best place people are being taken without you know any reason that people are being you know taxed unfairly um you know that definitely does a lot to show and what's going on um even if you know sometimes it still doesn't seem like he quite has the best grasp on that mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it's just one of those things where I, i'm interested as we go through to see the key points where it becomes clear like how well the fire nation is doing in the war because you know when we get to like early book two and they've taken omashu it kind of feels like oh so bossing say is the last earth kingdom city left but it's kind of not really because you know just episodes later we're in gaoling which doesn't really seem to be affected by the fire nation and um, and it's just that sort of slight sense of because we ever overly focus on where each location is for the most part it's hard to keep track of like okay wh where is occupied where is not um where's the fire nation struggling where are they in control um that sort of thing but we'll, we'll we'll get into the episode here so i think we have to start off with the the main thing here which is that yes it is an earth kingdom village taken over by the fire nation and as we know about from the way that the Fire Nation approached the airbenders of wiping them out. We know the reason that Katara is the last southern waterbender. The Fire Nation take the approach of taking out the benders of their opposing nations. And so this is what they're doing with the Earth King, uh, Earthbenders. Taking anyone who is seen to be an Earthbender. That's how cautious they are about other benders. And... I actually like the dynamic they set up with Haru, that they have him sort of scared almost to use his abilities, or he only feels okay with using them when he's completely on his own and he knows there's no one around. And similar to Katara, they do latch onto the dynamic with Haru that he feels connected to his father because of his bending, kind of adding a little bit more emotion on that it's not just like a superpower, that it's there's meaning to it as well. Uh, and in that sense, the, the Katara Haru friendship, which I never really feel like it leans in any way into romance with this, um, is actually quite good because they just have that sort of, uh, sort of similar backstory and Katara kind of wants to inspire him to be, you know, better, the, the person that he can be. Uh, and in that sense, like the, the core dynamic, I think of this episode does actually work. 
But uh, what are your thoughts on the the kind of initial setup of this episode? Yeah, I mean, I like, or I think it, it helps to sort of give context to the Fire Nation and their tactics, like you said. Like, that's something that they're doing in order to control people that, you know, otherwise they wouldn't necessarily be able to. Like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, like the Fire Nation size wise or maybe even density wise you know probably isn't quite you know anywhere near the size of the earth kingdom but you know they're able to use you know these tactics in order to control you know a populace of a foreign area um and clearly they're quite efficient in doing it and you know they use a whole bunch of different tactics in order to do this and you can see them put on display here so you know i that's a a good way of getting across how you know things are working and how things are being done um and of course you know through the episode through Haru's mother they sort of you know explain this in such a way that you know our characters seem to to get although you no know, i think ang still quite doesn't see sort of the severity of this even even later on when we do actually get to where they're all being held um but you know it definitely you know it's pretty clear that Katara and Sokka have, you know, a perfect understanding of, of how this works with their personal history. Yeah, a- a- Aang is characterized a little bit, like, nonchalant, I think, over the course of the episode. It's just like, uh, I get it's Katara's arc for this episode, and Aang doesn't have to be as focused, but, like, can we show a little bit more, like, kind of caring on this part? Um, uh, just a little bit. Um one other bit from the very early start of the episode, I, I do like that they kind of give a little bit of just the, the status, the situation. Haru's mother says uh, the Fire Nation have been there for five years and that the dynamic is that they use the co- the nearby coal mines to fuel the ships. Highlighting that again, the Fire Nation having such good technology is a large part of why a small island nation is able to be so powerful against like the mighty main mass of the the, the world and um, so that's quite interesting that there's this I think, relatively few instances where we get stuff like that where they just in the middle of one of these more one-off episodes just say that like oh yeah this has been the case for like five years or something so it's it's interesting just to know that like they've okay so at the very least they've been rounding up earthbenders in the region for the last five years and that some of the people that we see on the ship have been there for maybe five years or more and that that definitely puts it into perspective it's not just that oh katara experiences a day there and that's what it was for everyone no that you know this this is why so many of them at the end don't have hope why their spirits are broken is that it has been a couple of years five years for some of them so i do like that um what is the next part of the episode you want to talk about um, I guess I'll just continue along the line, and that's, I mean, I guess it's more focused around Katara, but I guess just sort of when they actually do get to where they're being held, and just sort of, I guess this sort of just goes into the whole idea of Katara and just her sort of hope dynamic that we're always sort of talking about. Yeah, so, so, so this is the episode where the whole hope Tara thing comes from. Some people are frustrated by the character being a little bit too preachy, <laughs> and this is the episode where maybe it leans a little bit too much in that direction but i still think it's fine um here because the speech that she gives she mentions that like she's heard stories of earthbenders and stuff like that she she knows what the people of the earth kingdom are like and so she expects these words to be able to kind of get people going but it doesn't because even she doesn't know the full scope of the situation and what the warden has been doing and so on so I, I, I do like that dynamic of, like, when we meet Tyro, he's so nice, he, like, offers her food and stuff like that, um, and she's just like, oh, so uh, bring me up to speed on the plan, and he's like, w- what plan? The plan is just to survive. That's all he's focused on, is just keeping people alive. That's how bad things are, that they they don't even consider trying to escape because of how little control they have of the situation, and... Um, we do get like so what is one of Katara's main character traits, um, which is the whole, you know, I'll never turn my back on people who need me. And I, I like that she stays after the initial agreed upon, you know, twelve hour time window. Um 
that all works in that like this is getting across the Katara from the like opening monologue that she has hope the Avatar will return. She has hope in other people, you know, the 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 war ending and things changing. That yeah, this, this adds into it. It's not just about the Avatar for Katara. It's also the bigger picture as well, inspiring people also. But uh, w what are your thoughts on how uh, they do Katara when she meets Tyro and the others? Yeah, I mean, she does seem to have like almost sort of like a, a unwavering type of faith and hope in people and their ability to overcome the situations, which, you know, I think is, you know, something to be commended for for her character, considering everything that, you know, she's had to go through, like plenty of people in her situation would be, you know, quite distraught at, you know, everything that's going on in the world. So, you know, the fact that she's at least able to attempt to sort of like inspire, you know, these people, um, you know, is something to sort of be commended upon. Um, but, you know, like you said, she doesn't quite have a full grasp or full, I guess you could say, understanding because she does know that they've been taken away. So like you said, you know, these people could be here for like over, you know, five years. Um, but, you know, this is something that she's sort of, you know, having to actually see, you know, up front for herself, which, of course, you know, leads into other things later on um, in the season or in the show. Um, but no, I think, you know, I like her initial idea of having, you know, this sort of like, you know, grand speech. You know, maybe it is a bit sort of preachy or a bit sort of idealistic, as I think uh, the warden actually says. But she does, you know, make some good points there as well. Yeah, there's one point I latched onto here is that in the, in her speech, she does say she's from the Water Tribe, and the warden doesn't have any reaction to knowing that now about her. <laughs> that like someone who's not an Earthbender is here. I guess from his perspective, it's like, okay, I guess there's a waterbender on the thing now, and that's okay, even though he can't swim. And I suppose she doesn't, she only says she's from the water tribe. She doesn't say she's a waterbender. He doesn't know that. But given what we later learn about how, like, fearful in a way the firebenders are of waterbenders because of basically Hama, um, you'd think there'd be a little bit more of a reaction. Um, but, you know, it's it's fine. The warden is like so overconfident that he's beaten them down, broken their spirits that he he looks on initially when he, when she starts to give the speech is like oh, but then like two like two lines in he's like oh they're not reacting, go ahead and um, basically so um that's that's fine um yeah I, I th I'd say my only problem with like the first guitar speech is that. It almost feels too like um, like scripted or something like that. That she didn't just come up with that on the fly. Like it's so it was if it, it was such a like you know this is a speech. It's not just Katara saying how she feels. It was like truly written as a full on speech. Um, and if it was just a little bit more natural, I think it would have been better because I think that's where she works well in like her later episodes when. Like in The Painted Lady, she says, you know, I'll never turn my back on people who need me and so on. Um, so that's that. I do like, though, when we get the sort of the plan incorporated of like, OK, maybe they need to have the hope, the inspiration, but also the practical aspect of they have Earth to fight back with. So we'll bring the coal in. It, it, it works. She tries to give the speech again, and it seems to not work, but it actually gets Haru to fight, which in turn gets Tyro to fight, and it starts the, the whole chain reaction. So it ends up overall working, and it's actually a quite like impactful scene when Tyro leads the Earthbenders to properly attack back, and they do the combined wall of uh, coal, and they just like take out all the firebenders. It's... Um, it's it's really cool and kind of energetic once it does get going. And I like this fight scene because you get to see sort of everyone in action a little bit. Like, Aang gets to do the coal cannon thing. Um, Sokka, we've been kind of focusing on, like, when is he going to get his chance to shine? A little bit in the last episode. He's, like, uh, like uh, using his, like, boomerang to smash, like, spears and throwing them up to Momo to get, like, the, the dangerous weapons out of the way. 
that was quite good from him of like immediate growth that like he's basically defeating basically firebender soldiers or, or fire nation soldiers like one-on-one -on -one, <laughs> uh just episodes into the show so that's quite good um katara doesn't does katara do any fighting in this i i, I can't quite remember the action scene but i think that's maybe the only maybe slight weakness here is just that katara doesn't do that much she's 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 inspired this all to happen but i wish maybe she got more of an action scene <laughs> but what are your thoughts on on the action the inspiration actually working in the final scene yeah i mean i i like that scene i mean you know it does take a bit for it to sort of ramp up and i think you know haru being sort of like the most recent person put there and being sort of the the youngest has like you know the least you know broken spirit um in terms of doing things so it, it makes sense that he's the one to sort of push forward and then his father sort of follows up with things um and that you know like you said that gets everything moving and you know the scene itself i think is, is pretty cool i mean you get to see you know sort of earth bending done in a different way when they have sort of like a limited set of materials that they can use although you know it seems like they have ample amount being you know on this whole rig that is you know designed for doing coal um but no you get to see you know a couple different sort of bending techniques you get to see a lot of them sort of working in conjunction with each other which is something that you haven't really sort of seen up until this point so you know it definitely shows you a lot of different varying skill sets um they also sort of like you know they, they win the day as well and you know you get to see you know how I don't know, it works in sort of isolation here. And yeah, Katara doesn't have any scenes where she's doing much. She is really just sort of the, the spire instigator of this whole issue here, which I guess, you know, maybe, you know, her skills are too new. She can't quite, you know, figure out how to bring water up from the area around her, which that kind of makes sense. Like, she doesn't really know how to water bend. She just knows how to do sort of what comes naturally at this point. So I guess it's not too surprising, but I do like that Sokka does have like a standout moment um, here where, you know, he is able to sort of take the weapons away from other people, which I don't know. I wonder if that seems like too much too soon or if that just seems the right amount, um, you know, since he did get some formal training at this point. Um, but you know, I still like that he's, able to do that at this point and you know they are able to somehow figure out how to get off of this rig um with seemingly like everybody uh, so that's always yeah. good i think in reflection I, I i think the one thing that probably could have improved the episode to give katara a little bit of action and maybe just make the overall dynamic work a little bit better would be um instead of just haru almost like randomly firing a shot i would have liked it if that <clears throat> like nothing happens Katara brings some water up and is ready to fight and maybe takes out the first guard who comes up to her but is going to get overwhelmed and then Haru jumps in with his earthbending to mm -hmm. like save Katara and we go from there uh, so we don't just see like Katara give the speech and it work but also show that she's willing to fight as well I think that would have been just the, the slight little thing that would have put it over the edge um, but it's it's still good for what we get in terms of like we're characterizing Katara here for the most part. Um, the end plot point is that Katara loses her necklace in the middle of the action. And then we end with Zuko sort of finding it. He's on the trail again. And so uh, this is like the birth of Zutara, more or less. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, like the Zuko is going to come back into it after basically not being in two episodes. So... Um, it is interesting to note that that there there's a, a an example of like say for the live action show coming up, I can't see them doing some of this like this accurately where like we just are without Zuko to do these side plots for all this amount of time and um, the this is why in a way some of these episodes aren't like the absolute strongest parts of the book is because we're focusing a lot on these little things without other main characters uh, coming into play as much so um what, what are your thoughts on the uh the, the final scene here zuko returns after two episodes 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you got to figure out how to get Zuko into the plot, and this seems like a good setup way. I don't know if you sort of think how much that's going to mean the first time you go around and see this, but you no, know, they they hold you no, know, they set up in the beginning of you know the necklace being the connection to her mother. Um, so you know, it makes sense that they're able to sort of play off of that at the end here, and we know how that goes later on as well. And then uh, I suppose the last point I'll just make is just um, there's maybe a little bit of sort of like metal bending foreshadowing here of like they have all these earthbenders mm-hmm. out on this ship that they feel they've kept them away from earth because the ship's made of metal and um, they're maybe not considering the fact that coal is earth. So even just that little thing of like a super early on clarifying to us that coal which comes out of the earth is actually like bendable is like an interesting point to have because that's ultimately what gets us to metal bending is just the idea of like okay impurities and coal is bendable because of this reason and so you can extend that to uh, metal as well and that's quite nice uh, I think did they have a fully planned out here was this meant to be a full-on foreshadow i'm not sure but I, I i like that just the the kind of technical point of yeah they can bend coal what, what were your thoughts on on that the whole kind of imprisoning earthbenders on metal ships and then the fire nation maybe not understanding earthbending enough to know about the whole coal connection i wonder about the the coal connection because i feel like they probably you know, to some degree, understood the idea of that being bendable, you know, because, I don't know, because it feels like that's sort of, like, in the bowels of the sort of rig that they're on here, although it does seem odd that, you know, they would have them anywhere near close to it, but, you know, maybe they just don't feel like their range can extend to where it actually is, because, I mean, you don't quite understand how far it is away from them, sort of on that sort of, like, upper level platform i mean it feels like when ang has to go down there for the little bit that you do see of it it feels like it's quite a way so maybe they thought that was enough of a distance um but you know regardless the idea that they can bend it is really cool and that you understand that sort of concept and you know at this time at least we believe that you can't bend metal um I do wonder if that was foreshadowing. I mean, I don't know. I guess it really depends on how far they really plan things ahead of time. But regardless or not, you know, as far as, you know, the world understands at this point in time, no one can bend metal. So, you know, it seems perfectly plausible that they would think that that is a thing that would hold, you know, earthbenders back at this time. Um, you know, there's, you know, I don't think, you know, the nations are really up for sharing, you know, how bending works really well between the different nations, especially since, you know, they're at war right now. So, you know, it wouldn't be surprising that they don't quite have all the information at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then probably my last point about this episode is just that I do think the scene earlier on, the kind of fake fight, earth bending style is actually a really, really fun scene. (laughs) I, 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 I like that they like almost go over the top with how like Ang's not listening he's just like yeah, yeah yeah I got I got the plan just go for it yeah go on and I love the overly kind of scripted fight that they have it's so obvious that they're acting um Sokka taking offense to you know what Katara actually says um the full like little anime shot of her doing the earthbending style and then add on to that that the fire nation soldier thinks that it's momo doing it and then Sokka's like what it's it's the girl not her and he's like oh he's like disappointed so i thought that was actually like very very funny um it, it's like probably one of the only like main like humorous scenes in the episode but uh, i thought it was actually quite good um there's also you know is it a buffalo or a bison later on that's kind of nice but um nothing too much uh, but is there any final points about this episode you want to bring up um no i think that's it for me yeah yeah so so these ones like are are fairly to the point but this episode definitely kind of like just the, our, our initial point here about uh earth the earth kingdom involvement in the war and that okay tyro's in action and it makes sense like okay like that 
because of Katara in this episode and almost going out of her way here to get involved in these people's lives, she has created an ally for them to come back to later on. And this is like, I think, a point that's brought up very heavily in like the Painted Lady. It's this idea of like, she won't turn her back on people who need her. And because of that, and because the group ends up doing that a lot, that's why they have the allies that they have for like the invasion later on. That if they just focused on Sokka's plan, they might not have met that many people that are their allies if they just kept to themselves. But because they do kind of stop everywhere along the way and become friends with people, they have a wide variety of allies at the end. So these one-off episodes are needed uh, to establish uh, a lot of these characters. And it's it's interesting to just note, like, as we go on, like, the ones that really, really work and the ones that maybe don't quite. So episode four, Suki, like, 100%, Team Avatar member. Boomy, like, one of the best benders in the show. Old Master, Order of the White Lotus, absolutely. Haru, mm, kind of, but not so much. It's kind of telling that when he comes back, the most interesting <laughs> thing about him is the mustache. And that's almost the joke, is that, like, there isn't that much else to his character. So w- what are your thoughts on that? That, like, after we've had a few episodes where, like, the highlight is effectively the introduction of a new minor character, what are your thoughts on uh, how Haru does and when they bring him back and so on? Yeah, I mean, in like the grand scheme of like, you know, the major minor characters, he he definitely feels a bit sort of lower end. I mean, I think, you know, it also might just be a little bit unfair because, you know, our main, you know, Earthbender that we compare him to is like the best in the world, arguably so tough. So, you know, in terms of having like another Earthbending character on your team or that's like associated with your group him his father and you know the group that they're around you know doesn't rank as high there they're definitely you know important and needed in terms of just you know having enough people to even attempt to do what they do later on um but you know could that have been done a different way could we've met them later on could they've just been part of another group um you know it could be you know argued against them in terms of like the overall importance i think them coming to this place in this location might have served more of like setting a stage for things of the world in general more so than meeting them specifically um but you know the way the story goes they do play a role that is you know important to the overall plot so the way that they have it set up they do matter Mm -hmm. but uh yeah there are reviews for this episode and on the next episode we will be reviewing again three episodes uh so we're going to do avatar 107 Avatar 108, so they're both parts of Winter Solstice, so the Spirit World and then Avatar Roku. And then on the Korra side of things, we're going to do K106, which is And the Winner Is, the kind of like mid-season finale where we end the sort of probe ending stuff, get into the Equalist stuff once again. So that's a quite action-packed episode. And is also sort of uh, the it's kind of like the, the, the redemption of Lynn, in a way. It's when she starts to properly become a, a liked character uh, in that episode. On the Avatar side of things, it's going to be interesting because um, for lore kind of reasons, I always find 107 to be a bit of a weird episode in terms of like, okay, cool, introduce the spirit world, but they also do it very weird and almost like needlessly complexly. And then 108 is obviously a, such an important early plot episode as well as just finally all the big events begin to sort of come together in that like it's Zhao, Ang, Zuko all together and it's uh, really, really good. And Roku, of course. So um, I'm pretty excited for the, the, the interesting group of episodes next time out. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on those three for next time out? I mean, the, for the core one, I think that's a good one just because, you know, you get more interesting pro bending as more as just overall what's happening in the world of Korra at that point in time. And then, yeah, on the Aang side, I mean, the spirit world is always interesting, although we always reference that, that episode as being one of the more 
odder ones in terms of how uh, 107 actually works, but the idea of being introduced to Roku is, I think, is always cool. That's like a standout moment. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the next episode we will get to them. As we also, I suppose, from a news perspective, pretty much at this point, we're waiting for the the build up to uh, the Yang Chen book and probably just news about what, if anything, is going to be happening at Comic Con. Uh, with all the delays that have happened to comics, it's kind of cleared everything out in the middle of the year to the point where we're kind of just waiting for new announcements about things we don't know about and, you know, just if anything's going to happen at uh, San Diego Comic Con coming up shortly. So we'll get a panel announced uh, in the weeks beforehand and hopefully from there find out uh, what's happening. Uh don't know how much hope we necessarily should have about that, but uh, it feels like it's it's needed just to open things up across the board with uh, Avatar, that the secrecy, how Avatar Studios is affecting things just calms down a bit when they are finally able to talk about those first few projects. Hopefully that happens soon, but Yang Chen novel on the horizon is definitely the the main thing. So that has been episode 244 of the Avatar Online podcast. It's been myself and Greg. Thanks for listening and bye. Bye Bye-bye.